This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, what I want to um, suggest today, really, is that uh, paying attention to objects' journeys and objects' journeys through differently gendered spaces can help us to understand the ways in which museums and public memory practices developed in the late 19th century and can show how different emotional effects could be embedded in those public memory practices. I want to focus on the souvenir, which has, as we've already heard, an intimate and private nature, but I also want to try and follow souvenirs into museums, uh, into public space as they're donated there, so that we can see how the public could be inflected with the intimate, and we can see how men's and women's ways of living with objects could produce different meanings for those objects. Um, <clears throat> I will be arguing that men and women use souvenirs differently and that women's souvenirs uh, show uh, an important change of emphasis from the museum as a place where domination was exhibited to a place where the emotional cost of war and conquest could be explored. And I think in this sense, women's souvenirs presaged in some ways uh, the way in which public history came to serve modern memory practices following the First World War. I won't be going past the First World War, but I think there's some interesting um, foreshadowing there. Now, I think the souvenirs are really tricky things to work with and to explore and uh, to examine, uh, to study. Susan Stewart and other people who've uh, looked at souvenirs have suggested that they're distinct from collections because they have Uh, significance on an individual basis. Uh, They're things which are only fully meaningful to um, an individual or to other individuals on the basis of their relationship with the first individual. It's all about relationships, um, quite intimate relationships. They follow, it's been argued, an emotional rather than a classificatory logic and therefore they're meaningless to people who don't share the original experience which the souvenir partially recreates. But I think um, souvenirs are more ambiguous, more multivalent than that, and can be understood as creating a collective uh, but emotional meaning for a wider group as well as for just an individual. Many souvenirs are objects whose meaning was indeterminate, ambiguous and fluid. Um, They're very rich in signification, but I think they're quite hard to trace, particularly in the museum context. And I think this is also because Victorian museum objects do suffer from a lack of documentation, which is quite ironic in a way. Um, So if we think about the method of object biography, um, what I've ended up with here is uh, more of a collective biography of objects. And I think if you look at um, life writing and the way people talk about uh, life writing, uh, they sometimes advocate collective biography for hard-to-trace groups often women, where you end up working with scraps of information and and putting together a kind of collective biography that way. That's what I'm trying to do here. Um, These are very obscure objects, and to do them justice, we need to kind of piece together scraps of information from different sources to try and make sense of the journey of the objects as a whole, Um, which is in some ways warning to say that I've got breadth, but I haven't got depth. But it's it's a methodological issue that I'm kind of wrestling with. So I'm going to briefly look at the development of touristic souvenirs in the 19th century and their relationship with museums, and then I'm going to uh, move on to my main focus, which is battlefield souvenirs. The collecting of souvenirs uh, expanded in the 19th century through a combination of um, the the romantic sensibility uh, privileging material remains of intimate experiences and the growth of overseas travel. And... From what I've um, found, particularly in relation to the Cook's tours and and the expansion of uh, tourism uh, promoted by uh, Thomas Cook and and in their archives, the souvenir collecting wasn't itself very strongly gendered. Um, There's uh, examples of men collecting crocuses from Palestine and keeping them pressed. Uh, Women and men go to the bazaars in various countries. It's it's quite... um, uh, ritualised in some ways. Everybody does the same things, it seems. But the later part of souvenirs' lives, after they've been collected, show different treatment, I think, of the objects by men and women. Um, And one thing that becomes clear is that women often gave objects collected by their male relatives to museums after the men's death, on average around 30 years after the original collection 
during which time, of course, the object had resided in the home of the collector and donor. So one example is a, a model of a Swiss chalet bought in Switzerland in 1844 by Mr. Sancroft Holmes, donated to Norwich Museum in 1880 by Mrs. Sancroft Holmes. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Um, so it's the female relatives believing that these objects now deserve public status, despite the original collector treating them as private objects. And I think the effect is that these donations bring with them into the museum not only the narratives of the collector's travels around the world, but also the narratives of um, their stay in a particular domestic family setting. And this is uh, enhanced by um, the insistence of the donors usually that lots of details of this provenance be, be recorded. And women are particularly in control of this route by which souvenirs enter the museums. They're the custodians of family memorialising, and they decide, it seems in most cases, which and when objects would be donated to the museum. So in that context, I want to look more specifically at military souvenirs, and particularly objects associated with a particular battle or campaign. Now, obviously, this is not a new type of souvenir. Uh, the granddaddy of them all is the Waterloo souvenirs, which become such a, such a huge thing there. Um, uh, and these are, are being collected from the battlefield pretty much from the minute it stops. Um, this is uh, Walter Scott's flags. I think he had a couple of flags. This is... Um, the, bo the bowl is made of wood. It says he cut from the Duke's tree at Waterloo. So it was, it was the tree that... Um, uh, Duke of Wellington was underneath during the battle um, and this one that was a really nice one isn't it um, uh, but apparently if, when your horse died you quite often kept a bit of it as a, as a sort of memorial particularly of the, the, the horses that are in battle now Judith Pascoe suggests that by the end of the 19th century this is you know, beginning of the 19th century stuff end of the 19th century stuff nobody had time for these sorts of relics or at least they didn't they excluded them from a world of public knowledge. They still perceived to be fine, ideal actually for your public, your personal experiences and narratives, keeping this kind of thing there. They didn't seem, she says, to have anything to offer to public knowledge and scholarship. However, their relatively common appearance in the record of objects donated to museums around 1900 suggests that this is not actually the case. There's no division, I would suggest, actually, between objects which produce knowledge and those which produce emotional effects. But there are different sorts of knowledge and different sorts of emotions produced, and one of the big differences is in the gender, the gendering of, of, of those emotional effects. Now, uh, military souvenirs were collected in several ways in the period. Serving soldiers brought home keepsakes, of course, but they were of interest to others, non-military people, uh, tourists as well. Um, in 1882, William Benrose, who was a partner in a family printing firm in Derby and a keen traveller, uh, went on a Cook's tour of Egypt and Palestine in the company of John Mason Cook and Frank Cook, who were both sons of Thomas. So he was, you know, he was well in with the family there. On the 10th of November 1882, they visited the battlefield of Tel El Kabir in Egypt. Uh, the battle had taken place two months earlier. Um, it was um, a picture of it. Yes, that tells you lots about it. It was um, a conflict between rebel nationalist forces in the Egyptian army and British forces aiming to restore the puppet ruler. And British victory at Tel El Kabir led to the British occupation of Egypt. Benro said in his diary. We picked up various relics. Shells, being too heavy for us to carry, were sent on direct to England, where in due course they arrived. Um, so that's one of the things they did, is they picked up shells. Uh, they also picked up this piece of paper, which you probably can't see, it's at the bottom here, picked up on the battlefield of Tel el -Kabit. He wrote on it, just so you know. Um, it is, in fact, the, the piece of paper is uh, discharge papers of an uh, elderly um, Egyptian man uh, whose eyesight was too bad to serve any longer and it's actually from the 1870s so it's, it's quite old by this point I have no idea what it was doing on the battlefield he clearly had no idea what it was but he picked it up because it was on the, the battlefield souvenirs collected by military men themselves tended more to have a, an overtly martial quality than this some examples from museums that I have found. Two skulls from the Battle of Scheller were donated to Liverpool Museum in 1891 by a surgeon Whiteman of the Navy. Uh, 
Now, the Battle of Shella was not actually a battle involving the British, so he he wasn't in the battle, but he was at the battlefield and picked it up. In fact, the battle had happened 80 years earlier. We don't know exactly when he acquired the skulls, only that he donated them uh, in 1891. It's interesting that they're sh- skulls that he's um, collected there. Um, work on skull collecting in the military in the 19th century suggests they're not infrequently kept as trophies. Um, Harrison has shown an extensive collection of skulls, other body parts, but mainly skulls and heads, by British soldiers in southern Africa in the second half of the 19th century, some taken from battlefields, but some apparently bought from peddlers of war relics. Uh, Other donations by military men to museums include objects relating to another battle, the Battle of Omdurman, uh, presented by Arthur Earle, Esquire, who was the brother of General William Earle, who had been there and had died not there, but fairly shortly afterwards, in 1904. Uh, And another Arabic uh, uh, piece of writing, a parchment scroll picked up on the battlefield of Guinness, Sudan, 1885, from Lieutenant Colonel Wilson in 1909. So what actually there there does seem to be is a clustering of these um, souvenirs around the British campaign against the Mahdist forces in the 1880s and 90s in Sudan. Um, which had a very big impact on British consciousness, featuring in novels by Kipling and Mason, very heavily covered in the press, particularly the pictorial press, from which some of these illustrations are taken. It is reported that following the defeat of the the Mahdist forces, General Kitchener himself ordered the body of the Mahdi to be disinterred and decapitated. Um, And he wanted to keep the head, apparently as either a potential ink stand or to be given to the Royal College of Surgeons Museum. That's a very interesting either or, isn't it? Um, but there, it, there was a big outcry back in Britain. The story got out. Queen Victoria was horrified. There was outcry everywhere and they quietly took the head and buried it somewhere uh, in Cairo. So what seems to be coming from these souvenirs collected by the military men is um, souvenirs bound up with a certain version of masculinity. They're often described using the language of hunting. They show a certain view of racial characteristics and they also endorse the scientific value of these battlefield relics. And Harrison says, uh, quite a useful quote from him, the question of whether the skulls of African battlefield dead were collected and displayed as scientific specimens as hunting trophies or as war mementos may be somewhat moot, given that these distinctions may not always have been meaningful to the Victorians, for whom the similarities between these modalities of appropriating bodies seem often to have been deeper than the differences. So they're not really distinguishing between different ways of collecting, but they are showing a a sort of a hyper-masculine interest in demonstrating power and conquest throughout. But material from British uh, military encounters abroad often came back to Britain through a family route and as with other sorts of souvenirs women are also important in donating these objects to museums once they've already come back to the home in Britain usually after the man who collected it died so a number of examples where we're straying past 1900 I'm afraid Brighton Museum 1910 a finger ring obtained during the first Zulu war uh, was donated 1913 objects um from the punitive expedition to Benin um, are donated and a helmet worn by one of the 600 at the charge of Balaclava is presented to Brighton uh, Museum by Mrs James Barker. So these are objects which are brought back to Britain by male relatives of the donors. The male field collector then at some point dies, either in the field or or, uh, later on, and the the surviving female relatives give the object to museums. And I think this confirms this idea that women were acting as custodians of the material memory of the families, their families. The men collect the objects as souvenirs of their military travels, evidence of their involvement in historic events and bring them back to Britain. One thing that I think is crucial to try and explore, but I haven't yet managed to do so, is to, is to find out where these objects were during the period when they're in the home before they come into a museum because I think that would be very interesting to know where they are. And then the women give the objects to museums stipulating that the previous ownership be recorded and the relationship of the donor to the field collector be recorded and kind of layering the emotional meanings of the objects there. 
There is a sense, I think, in which women felt quite ambiguous about these objects, which embodied members of their family, but also symbolised this highly masculine environment. Um, and I think that might be behind some of the donation of the objects to museums. Um, you can get them out of the house that way. Um, you, can, you can get anything disturbing outside your house. But because they are members of your family, you can't throw them away. You have to give them somewhere appropriate, like, uh, like a museum, for example. It's very. Uh, it's an interesting uh, insight from from Harrison's uh, work. Uh, he talks about a, a military man who was fighting in, in South Africa, and he brought back a skull uh, who he thought was a named person. Uh, he was probably wrong about that, but he kept it on his mantelpiece in Gloucestershire somewhere, I believe, until he got married. Um, and his wife insisted that he be given a Christian burial. Uh, <laughs> he wouldn't have that thing in the house uh, anymore. Um, so I think this impulse to donate to a museum is similar in some ways. These, are, these are, can be quite disturbing objects, although, generally speaking, when we're talking about uh, the, the ones that the women give, they're not in themselves skulls. So these um, female military souvenirs enter museums through a a different route and they remember and celebrate family members in public while the masculine ones in museums anyway tend not to. I think this is quite a new type of public history obviously it's not that people hadn't mourned and celebrated soldiers before but doing so in what are relatively new local public museums founded to improve and civilize Victorian towns is I think a significant uh, new development. Um, and by virtue of the location in this kind of part of the, the, the civic structure, the museum, it's a way to acknowledge the social impact of imperial conquest while still allowing it to be rooted in families. I think here of Alison Landsberg's uh, assertion that with the advent of modernity, new memory practices were needed which worked on a different sort of scale to previous ones um, that, that kind of transcended the family or the household but yet retained the emotional depth of those small-scale memory practices. And I think by bringing the domestic and the public into contact in this way, uh, women's donations contributed to the development of modern memorialisation. Men's uh, military souvenirs, on the other hand, um, tended more to bring uh, the battlefield itself into contact with the museum, and this could be difficult. There were outcries in Britain about the head collecting thing. As I say, the fact that Victoria is horrified is uh, symbolic. And often what happened to skulls collected in the immediate aftermath of the battle is that they were um, intended for the Royal College of Surgeons Museum, which is not open to the public um, at this time. So there is a difference between what men and women do with the souvenirs once they've got them. Women kind of naturalise them by making them part of the domestic environment. Um, and then, in donating them to museums, they uh, link the public forum for understanding military conquest with the family sphere of emotion and memory, thereby removing, to a certain extent, uh, the unsettling presence of violence inherent in the objects. Men's objects sometimes told a different story, a colonial narrative of conflict, aggression, power and control, this was a narrative which could sometimes merge with the language of science and objectivity, but sometimes it just couldn't. It kind of overspilled and became too violent, I think, for Victorian society. So examination of uh, battlefield souvenirs reveals a complex emotional territory. Late Victorian imperial strategies needed to encourage a certain amount of aggression. Uh, Harrison suggests actually instrumental savagery was kind of the aim of, of some of the... Uh, practices within the military uh, but in Britain this needed to be toned down and the boundaries between our civilization and their uh, savagery needed to be reinstated and uh, made clear. On the other hand the intensification of colonial warfare during this period created a need for a more public way of mourning and acknowledging the loss that this created. Objects, and particularly souvenirs, with their ability to carry an experience through multiple contexts, to be both objective and subjective, were the ideal way to try and both plot and manage this complex territory.